on, uh, please go ahead just and feel free to put them in the chat. Um, or if you even want to just put kind of where you're calling in from, we'd love to see kind of just where, uh, yeah, where people are joining us from, from Turtle Island and beyond. And so my name is Lindsay. I am the Communications Director at Indigenous Climate Action. Um, I'm Chickasaw, Irish, and Polish. I'm originally from south of the Medicine Line uh, from Michigan, and I've been up here in so-called Canada for about uh, two years now doing some uh, very fun and very rewarding work with ICA and doing a lot of activism in other places as well. Um, and so happy to be able to be on this webinar today. Um, I was introduced to Warren for a previous webinar that ICA had done um, in collaboration with Indigenous Environmental Network. And um, through that, Warren said, like, it'd be great if we had a, if we had a webinar where we could talk about two spirit stories. So this seemed like a great time with June being Pride <laughs> Month in many places to just kind of come together and to be able to celebrate two spirit identities and to be able to talk about how we can be more inclusive of two spirit identities, both within kind of the indigenous rights movement and within the, the queer movement, all of these different things. Uh, so with that, I'm going ahead and pass it to my, my co-moderator, Warren, just to introduce himself. Um, and yeah, just kind of give a little bit of a, a background as to, yeah, what a, what a true spirit identity is and what it means to indigenous communities. So Warren, off to you. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. I, I appreciate the introduction and um, I just want to welcome everybody to the webinar and the participants that will be sharing their stories. Um, I thought when uh, Lindsay approached me from the previous uh, webinar, asked me if it was uh, something that we could do to provide stories for our, our Indigenous people across Canada or or even internationally, just to share a little bit who we are and um, about our own personal journey, about coming to terms or acceptance of who we are. So today I just wanted to just uh, also acknowledge the Indigenous Climate Action Group for um, giving us this opportunity to share our stories and being, it's an honor and it's a privilege. And I also wanted to um, acknowledge that it being Pride Month and, and the celebration that we have every year in, so this is uh, remarkable and so it's, I find now with technology, this is a new way of bringing us together. And so I'm excited and I'm really happy to see you all here. Um, so I just wanted to um, share a little bit about my own experience. And um, I can only talk about the things that I've been through and as a two-spirit person. And so um, in the early years of, um, my getting to know or coming to an understanding of who I was. Um, it was way back in the um, 1990s, early 1990s, and I attended a two-spirited gathering and it was out in uh, BC. And it was the first time I really connected and I was so blessed and uh, Albert was one of the individuals that was, uh, um, that helped me come to some understanding about our ways of knowing in regards to being two-spirit. And so it's really an honor to be here with him today and all of you. So part of the uh, journey that I took, I started my healing journey back in February of 2000, oh, sorry, uh, 1990, uh, 1989. And so when I started my healing journey, part of that was one of the issues that I had to come to terms with and deal with, <coughs> who I was as a two-spirit. And, um, and so I was led to different uh, gatherings and national gatherings and I really learned a lot about myself and other people. And so along that, um, uh, back in, um, just to give you a little bit about the historical aspect, um, back in 2001 and two, um, I was approached by two individuals and that was uh, Dela Hennecke and uh, Richard Jenkins who came to me and asked me if I would help them in regards to developing something, a survey, and also looking at how we can implement something for Two-Spirit people in Edmonton area or Alberta. And I was living in Calgary at the time and I was more than happy. And we actually started our own Two-Spirit group back in Calgary. And so we said it was a great idea for us to exchange, go back and forth and uh, share our resources and knowledge. And um, they were, um, significant in how we developed the Two-Spirit Circle of Edmonton Society. 
And so they were the founders. They did a survey and they went out to the community and asked them, you know, what are the things that we need and what are the support services that we need for Two Spirit? And so from that, it evolved to many things. And one of the things was the cultural component is how can we come back to our ways of knowing and, and restore that knowledge again? And then the other thing too was, you know, where can people go for support if you are dealing with um, certain issues in your life? And so that was really um, an honor to be, has been an honor to be part of that. And so from that, um, we kind of went on our journey and we had different gatherings along the way. And uh, we were involved with some elders in Alberta. And those two elders that were teaching us was uh, Leonard Saddleback and George Breton, who was from Saddle Lake. And they were remarkable. And um, I can't speak enough about them because of the knowledge that they have and the wisdom and the um, gifts that they brought to us. And so <clears throat> we got a lot of the teachings um, about who we are and um, in our purpose and what is our role as Two-Spirit people in modern time and how we're going to be um, connecting and working with others. And <clears throat> So just about like a little bit about the history um, in regards to us as indigenous people, you know, with the um, being colonized and putting on to being putting on to First Nation communities or reserves and then in the introductions of residential school and religion and the 60 scoop and now the child welfare system that has had a major impact on how we think and feel about ourselves. And so I, this is part of the education and awareness that um, I do today is to teach people about some of that historical context and how it impacted on who we are. And so with the teachings um, from those elders, you know, what I learned is that we have a role and within that sacred circle, we sit in the middle and meaning that we have that male and female energy and that we have a place and that and within that role, you know, we have gifts, and those were leaders, leaders, visionaries, healers, medicine people, mediators, um, hunters, gatherers. So many of our people um, lost some of that along the way because of the introduction of this Western way of thinking and this influence. And so today, um, in some contexts, we've lost our, some people have. Um, I guess in communication with their language and their communities and, and that has been fractured. And so what we're doing is we're trying to bring that back and to, a, to our sacred place. And so I was taught in, in regards to the other elders that shared, us, shared with us was uh, Jerry Settleback and his wife and they talked about the eight genders. And in some communities they may talk about different ones but these are some of the teachings that we got from Jerry and his wife. And he talked, they talked about, um, you know, the eight different genders. So that's gay, lesbian, bisexual, um, queer, intersex, androg androgynous, and transgendered and non-binary. So these are some of the genders that, um, you know, were honored and highly revered in our communities and they were respected. And along the way, when Western influence came, those things got fractured and had been put away. And we also had our ways of doing things, our own ceremonies, our ways of doing things, I mean, connecting. And um, we were held in high regard in our communities and um, we were recognized in our communities. And so we're in a time now where we're um, re, I, I guess re, I mean, reconnecting again. And we're also bringing it life it's life force. And so along the way, I've met many teachers, knowledge keepers that have amazing gifts to bring to the world. And um, I feel very honored to be with all of you that are here today to share your stories or your experiences. And so this is what I wanted to share. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Warren. Um, also just clarify as well that I don't identify as Two-Spirit either. I do identify as Indigiqueer, if you will, but not Two-Spirit. So I also feel so incredibly grateful just to be able to 
listen to everyone on this panel and to hear your whole your like mini history <laughs> lesson learned. I'm very grateful for that. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, I, I think it's really important for us to, um, yeah, with, with Pride Month happening this month, um, yeah, it just seemed like a good time to be able to have a conversation like this to kind of bring a, a decolonial lens to pride and to uplift two-spirit relatives and two-spirit stories um, within our communities because a lot of two-spirit folks are both left out of the pride movement, um, but then also maybe not exactly are those under identities understood either uh, by people within the indigenous community. So I think this is a good way to bring up some more of those those conversations. Um, and so again, thank you so much, Warren, for, for sharing that, that history with all of us. And so, yeah, we're just gonna do kind of a go around now um, with everyone having an opportunity to share a bit about themselves, um, their stories, and kind of where they're coming at this from. So we're gonna go ahead and start off with Albert, if you wanna introduce yourself and your story. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, I'm Albert McLeod. I'm a co-director of the Two-Spirited People of Manitoba and Winnipeg. And I've been a part of this organization since 2006. And we've done a lot of education, outreach, um, advocacy around Two-Spirit issues. And uh, I first became involved in the Two-Spirit movement in 1979 when I moved to Vancouver. And we be became part of the Greater Vancouver Native Cultural Society which was a group of indigenous LGBT trans people living in Vancouver at the time. And there was a time when HIV was sort of making its way into Canada. So a number of our peers uh, became infected with HIV and many uh, passed away from AIDS. So that's sort of that historical legacy of uh, North American Two-Spirit people. And uh, uh, we responded to the pandemic by organizing, uh, becoming involved with uh, government health services, so like Warren talked about that role of sort of, uh, you know, leadership, uh, and it was a very sort of stigmatized issue. So we did some of those early interventions around HIV and AIDS in our communities, the basic education. But I wanna say that the movement in terms of uh, indigenous queer liberation began much earlier uh, in the US when, um, uh, some uh, First Nations people were forcibly relocated to urban centers and then that sort of was that connection to the broader gay community, gay bars. And then by 1975, Randy Burns and Deborah Cameron uh, created Gay American Indians organization in San Francisco. In 1979, fortunate for me, we had the Greater Vancouver Native Cultural Society in Vancouver and it's still active today, uh, like 40 one years later, still active. So our, our uh, liberation movement is very long in North America uh, compared to other movements that stop and start. Ours is still continuing today and uh, you know flourishing and then uh, creating opportunities for the young generation. So I, I'm a, a, god, a godfather to a 20 year old uh, youth who just graduated last year from high school and a surrogate grandmother to two young girls, eight and nine, who are sisters. They call me Granny Albert. And I think um, uh, uh, further to what Warren says, that other piece of our role in the community is providing that sort of uh, surrogate or chosen family roles uh, to maybe children or youth who don't have their birth family present in their lives to provide that sort of continuity of culture, the sense of family, the sense of community. And I'm just going to share a few slides uh, with you about uh, sort of an artistic point of view in the work that we've been doing. And I'm going to uh, just to give it's just a few uh, just to give you some context of the work that we've been doing. So uh, this is where I uh, I can't see that share slide so. slide show. So for myself, I'm a photographer, and this is the street I live on Winnipeg at St. Mary's Road, one of the early roads that probably connected with the U.S. Uh, pre-contact times when the Cree and Assiniboine would have traveled down into the Dakota Territory. So this is along the Red River. Uh, this is uh, the Two-Spirit People Manitoba website, plus my own uh, website, so I'm not, I'm not shy of... Uh, digital or online stuff uh, in terms of an, especially being an artist or a community activist 
and if we're looking at climate uh, change action, or you know, climate change action, it's really reaching large audiences, right? So it's using uh, the internet as a mechanism for reaching uh, or having a, a strong voice. Uh, my digital footprint looks like this. Um, the largest, uh, I did a press release and it uh, actually reached 14,000 people. So very proud of that. It may not seem like a lot of people to some people, but in terms of getting the message out. Uh, so again, uh, you know, I, I, I try to use digital technology as much as I can in terms of uh, doing uh, uh, activism and then to spirit advocacy and outreach. And this is uh, uh, one of the people who participated in the uh, uh, Two Spirit Powwow in San Francisco last year. It was their eighth annual powwow, and this person is uh, called Neptune. And it really talks to the beauty of Two Spirit people in that, uh, you know, we uh, interpret beauty, we express beauty, uh, the beauty of being a person, uh, of, uh, you know, using our art and, our, and all of that in, in our expression, and merging gender identities too. In that, in that process and not being uh, afraid of it. We live in a very heteronormative, you know, male dominated society that really is resistant to kind of any kind of, uh, you know, femininity and in the, in the masculine identity. And I think as two spirit people uh, or LGBT people, that's really part of our role to say it's okay, right? It's okay to express your masculinity, your femininity, or to even merge them. They shouldn't be seen as a threat. And I do memes as well. I love doing memes. And this is uh, uh, <laughs> Leonard Blackman. He's a CBC reporter with uh, CBC Indigenous. And uh, this was a photo that uh, was taken at a community event. And I inserted here the alien uh, in there. And, and him not being afraid of the alien, right? You just got to really stand up to that stuff. Then uh, some of the gender related stuff in our communities around ceremony, whether it's Sundance, pipe ceremonies, uh, sweat lodges, and just the politics about clothing, and uh, particularly around uh, you know women or trans women. And so uh, here's this activist from the States, uh, from the Dykes on Bikes movement, and she just passed away last year, and, and here she is sitting on her chopper. And, I, and it's really the message is, some women don't wear skirts. And if that's the issue at ceremony, don't even ask, right? Don't even try to, you know, because you're, you're really violating a person's, uh, you know, uh, boundaries, you know. Uh, other memes, and this is when he posts about smudging and thanking the creators, real traditional guy. So that little, I'm not sure if that's a frog or whatever it is, but. And then again, uh, doing some of the work around know, deconstructing homophobia and transphobia and this one. And so this one, because the Jets almost uh, won, um, I think it's the Stanley Cup. I always get confused with the Great Cup. Anyway, so I made this meme that year. And as myself, as a, as a two-spirit person and the gifts that we carry, I'm a textile artist, photographer. And the one on the, my left is actually Dana Danger's mother's uh, uh, outfit I made for her a few years ago and that is a hundred feet of ribbon on that on that and so Bitch, again I recognize it I know <laughs> that outfit that was you yes. oh. and again and this was the commemoration of the uh, national um, no it was uh, Christy Belcourt's uh, uh, work around uh, the murdered and missing women. And so this was a couple of amps I put into that national uh, exhibition that went around. And uh, just a closing slide. Uh, Boyd Whiskey Jack is with the Edmonton Two Spirit Society. And we were fortunate to be last year in New York Pride March. It was the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. And so uh, we marched. This is actually Fifth Avenue. And uh, Boyd and I had a whole block to ourselves because the elders were walking so slow. <laughs> and so we had, uh, we, had the whole, we had Fifth Avenue. And this is the thing about being too spirit, right? You could go around the world and this is amazing, fabulous things will happen. And that's part of our gift, right? That's part of our gift. And so, so that's my little piece and uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Albert. I see a 
bunch of people on our Facebook are commenting about how beautiful the pictures are. So thank you very much for sharing all of your pictures. And also that one of Neptune, I, I love TikTok, I'll admit, and I see Neptune on TikTok all the time. So that's great. Love, love all of these things coming together. What a small world. Thank great. you so much for sharing. Uh, and next we're going to go ahead and go to Geraldine. So Geraldine, if you want to share some of your story as well. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, Geraldine McManus. Um, oh, I guess I got started. Uh, I, was, I was a single mom, and I raised. Uh, so I, I spent the majority of my life raising my son, working. I was a tradeswoman. Um, so I'm a retired house flipper now, and um, I trained myself in absolutely everything because my mama used to always say to me, "My girl." Don't rely on having a man around. At that time, my mom didn't know I was gay, right? So I was only about 11 or 12 when she said that. And I always remember that. And, uh, you know, and she would teach me um, mechanics. So I was always doing my own stuff on my vehicles. Um, and um, so I retired from house flipping. I finished raising my son. And um, my, uh, my real father, my biological father, who I've met just before he passed away, in my 30s uh he uh passed away and then he came back and saw me and he told me that i was going to go and see the white buffalo and that i was going to exchange my exchange my hair with that buffalo and in, in in dakota culture i don't know what it is for anybody else but in dakota culture our hair is is extremely important um and it, and it means everything to us. We save our hair, we save our nails, we burn those at our ceremonies uh, to give back our spirit to the, to the ancestors. And so sharing hair with the white buffalo, I was pretty shocked. I'm like, like, how do you share your hair with a buffalo? Was my first question, right? But um, it was all shown to me uh, through a vision. Uh, I was told to prepare for four days and that, um, uh, to cleanse myself before I go see the white buffalo. So I went through this whole thing entirely, you know, by myself, um, listening to ancestors because I hear them loud and clear. They talk to me um, sometimes any time of the day, uh, mostly at night, but during the day if they need to get something across to me. And um, so they just showed me stuff. And I didn't know I had had a bundle. Um, I guess over the years, you know, um, also working at the powwows, I have my own clothing line called Aboriginal Wear Clothing. It's trademarked in Canada. And um, so um, traveling around all these years and blah, blah, blah. I guess, I don't know, I, I was being given gifts. And so when at that four days, I was asked to cleanse um, to go see the white buffalo. Uh, uh, they showed me that I had had a bundle because I actually, I did never know what a bundle was or, or how you come about getting one, right? Now, I wasn't going to go ask these silly questions, right? Because I'm indigenous, I should know this stuff. But you know what, you don't really when it comes to that kind of stuff. And so, you know, uh, I think, I think it, the, the understanding is there that you'll know when to put your bundle together. And so that four days of cleansing before I went seeing the white buffalo, the, um, the ancestors were showing me, showing me how to properly clean an eagle feather because my eagle feathers were dirty, um, showing me um, the stuff that I had with me that was already my bundle. Um, they showed me how to lay it all down, how to put it together. And, and I was like, wow, okay. So I just did everything I was shown to do. And um, uh, I went in just before 2012 and went and seen the white buffalo. And you know, when I got there, I was standing there, and, and, and I actually did, I called them through my mind, and that's what they were showing me, because over the years, they've shown me how to use um, my mind to do things, which is communicate with animals, um, being able to hear medicines, being able to hear a rock talk, um, just understanding um, and communicating with all different kinds of animals as well. And so um, I... I, I went and I, 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 stand in, I, I was standing there and I was, they showed me how to do this little ceremony. And the white buffalo, um, I actually, I didn't know it was at the zoo. I thought I had to go to North Dakota. And, um, but it was in the zoo here in Winnipeg. And 
they were, and then uh, I found out it was Blizzard, the white buffalo, who was the Blizzard, and he's male. And this is the interesting part of this story, is that, so I went and seen Blizzard, I communicated with him. I haven't done, uh, actually I have pictures and I made like a little video and I've only shown it like twice now, that little video. And I was gonna show it on here, but I didn't have enough time to get over with you and get it to you. Um, so I went and see the video, or I went and see the Buffalo Ed Bob, called him, did the ceremony and called him. And from way from the other side of the, the field, he just lifted up his head and he looked at me and he come running right across the field towards me. And I have all the pictures to show you that. Um, some one of these days, maybe we'll do that. And um, so he came, and I and I was talking to Blizzard, and he came up and he was talking to me, and he was grunting in my face. And you could just see him in the pictures, like he's just grunting and talking to me, and, and that's how they talk, right? Buffaloes, they grunt at you. And so I'm talking to him, and I said, okay, so I'm here, and we're supposed to exchange hair, and I don't know how this is supposed to happen, and because as you well know, the hair on a buffalo is only the tuft on the top of their head. The rest is all fur. It's just that little tuft on the top of their head. That's hair. So how would you get hair off the head of a buffalo? I had no idea. So I just spoke with him, and I, and I took my hair out, and I said, we're going to share hair. And I gave him an offer, and I, I did the ceremony and took that out. And I put my hair in his, in, in, through, that, through that little fence. And, and he just looked at me with his big orange eye. And the moment he looked at me with his eye, I, it wasn't a normal eye. That eye was so huge, and it, there was no pupil. It was the it was the universe in in his eye. That's all I could see was the universe. And I had flashbacks of when I was really young, and I used to fly through that. And that buffalo showed me again what I saw when I was a little girl. And so it's very interesting how these things kind of work out because a lot of us, like, like, you know, like everybody knows, we're born, everybody's born with gifts, but it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's how you, you go through them throughout your life and how you remember them and, and, and how you utilize them later on in life. So, so I'm looking at the Buffalo's eye. He's looking right at me and he's showing me the universe. And after looking at his eye, and after he, he, he let me look into his eye, he turned and he put his head and pushed his head through the fence, the linked fence. And I went like, oh, that's how I'm supposed to get it. So I just put my hands on his head and, and all this hair came right out into my hand. These big, long hairs came out into my hand. And then later, um, actually, I didn't count them till later when an elder asked me and she says, well, how many hairs did he give you? And I said, well, you know what? I never thought about counting it. And um, so I opened it up and I counted and there were seven hairs. They're really, really nice, interesting, very long, very, very curly hairs. And um, so I've been carrying those. I was shown once to give one whole hair away to a woman. And, and the importance of that woman was she was a buffalo in her past life. And they showed me. It was actually a white buffalo calf woman came and saw me and that girl at Standing Rock and uh, showed me to give her to give her that hair and she was told she said uh, when we were sitting there a, a woman's voice said to her give her that now so that woman took off this necklace and it was a white buffalo i mean that woman just mad we didn't know each other and she says i was just whispered by some woman in my ear to give you this now that it was time for me to give this away because that girl had wore this white buffalo for for three years and she says i'd never taken it off but someone said that I had to give this to you, so I'm going to give it to you. She says, you know, like, uh, she's one of those women too as well, listens to the voices. And um, so it was, it's just a very, very interesting story. And, and while me and that woman were meeting at Standing Rock, um, I was the person who had that vision about that all the buffaloes were going to come running over that hill. And I told people in the camp at Standing Rock that I'd seen this vision. And um, it hadn't occurred yet. And, I, and then I got home, called home from Standing Rock. Uh, to come home and bury my adopted son. And when I was home, that's when everybody messaged me and said that the buffaloes came running over that hill, exactly the where I showed them that I saw them coming. And so that was pretty interesting. So a lot of stuff um, really happens with me with buffaloes, of course. And uh, uh, so coming back from Standard Rock, uh, I, I, I uh, opened up the camp, um, uh, Spirit of the Buffalo Camp, 
and ended up where the ancestors actually took me was my traditional Dakota territory. Um, because they showed me to come out there and, and where I am with the camp, that's, that's all was shown to me. And then while I was there for the, in the camp, uh, I was shown a lot of stuff. Um, and I, I try to, I try to tell these things to people, but you know what, honestly, I feel like, uh, not a lot of people are really interested in the stories that I have and that I talk about. Um, and the people who are, it's very surprising. Um, they're mostly Caucasian, to be honest. I, I, I don't know what to tell you guys, but that's who comes and listens to my stories. And, and I wish I could share with my indigenous people, but the audience for me is just not there. I, I, I don't know if people think I'm full of shit or what it is, but uh, you can't make up the stuff that I talk about. And, you know, the first time that I really fa felt validated with what I'm doing and what I'm going through was when I went up to um, the, the gathering last year for the environmental gathering up in Cold Lake, Alberta. And, and that's where I met the grandmother, the clan grandmother. And me and her had, we found out that we would miss each other all over. We just missed each other at Staten Rock. We just missed each other in Winnipeg. We missed each other at other gatherings and conferences. For, for years, we didn't know. We just kept missing each other. And so finally we met. And we realized why we finally met. Because um, me and her, me and the clan grandmother, we felt like we both had known each other our whole lives because of the stories that we had to share. And she said that, uh, you know, the, the grandmother said it was like I was her lost sister and she'd found me. And because of the stories that we talk about, because we hear the answers and they show us things and they tell us things. And sometimes it's very, very, very difficult to tell people what we're hearing and what they're showing us. And the only people you can really talk to those things about is somebody else who's actually living that same life. And, and me and the clan grandmother, we found each other. And you know what? I've never been so happy in all my life. I just got back from sitting with her again. And the work that I have to do to her. And that she told me that she's going to be going home soon. I finally find somebody that I can really talk to and relate to. And she's going to go home. So, you know, I, I guess coming back and just getting back and then having to come into this thing. And um, I'm... I'm um, I'm in, in a very emotional state right now because I fell so in love with, with the clan grandmother and she just loves me and we are just so connected. And the, um, our way of being as women and taking our places as clan mothers and clan grandmothers and being recognized as women uh, is so vitally important right now for Turtle Island. And it's why she asked me to call all the other clan grandmothers. She was shown stuff and we are shown things to tell the clan grandmothers. And these are really important things. And I wish people would really, really wholeheartedly listen to what the women who are having these visions and these dreams. And those women are out there. The clan grandmother says she knows they're hearing us because we're praying to them right now, me and her. And we're, we're, we're trying to get those ones to come together. And we've got so much information to share with them to, to validate who we are on this land and why it's important for us to do this work that we're doing. So I'm doing so many things right now. I opened a screen printing company called um, Spirit of the Buffalo Screen Printing. Um, and that's going to help uh, the environmental uh, movement for me in, in, in my, with my camp and the things that I have to do. Uh, I've designed clothes for years and years and years. Um, uh, my father was a designer. Uh, my mom was a sewer. So I, 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 I've got this stuff in me. So I'm, so I'm working on a lot of stuff right now. And, and most importantly is trying to call the clan grandmas together. You know, just when we call them together, COVID. Just like everything Indigenous people are doing right now. Everything we're doing to protect the land, to, to get out there to the camps and to, to support one another in different, different provinces, calling the clan grandmothers together to talk. This COVID has really put a strain on our indigenous movement. Our prophecy was the red people would rise last and there was many things that we're supposed to do. And yes, we're rising last. As you can see, look around, we're the last ones to rise up on Turtle Island and we're doing a heck of a good job. And then this COVID comes. And I swear to God, you know me, I'm like such a big conspiracy theorist. 
And I'm like, you know what, you buggers, you seen us coming. Y'all seen us coming and rising up. And, and next thing you know, put fear into everybody. Don't touch, don't go here, don't do that. Don't. How are indigenous people supposed to do our work? That's what we do. We gather together, we're close together. We pray close together. We sit around the fire together, close together. This COVID has just put a, just a, such a huge damper on everything that Indigenous people are aspiring to do and be right now. And uh, for myself, I'm, I'm very, very upset that, that, that these, uh, these, these media channels out there are spreading such incredible fear into everybody's hearts and lives. Uh, you know, I just sat with a lot of people that, you know, as Indigenous people, us, we don't stop what we're doing. I, I, I haven't, and, and many people, Indigenous people, we're safe, we take precautions, but uh, we're still doing what we have to do because we have to do it. We can't, we, we've took our breaks and, and you know, and I put off a lot of stuff and, and, and but I'm back in, I'm, I'm back on uh, doing what I'm doing. I have to get back to my camp and try to get that built because it got burnt down. Um, so the ton of work to do, you know, start my business, do the clan mother stuff. I'm working with the White Buffalo Spiritual Society. I sit on the board with that. Um, my uncle Calvin Pompana, um, you know, wants to introduce me to um, the UN because the White Buffalo Calf Prophecy is, is registered with the UN and, and I have to carry that on for my uncle because I now carry the, the hair of the White Buffalo. And uh, one last little tidbit, I believe the White Buffalo is two-spirited. It's a male, a male buffalo, but the hair is the spirit of the White Buffalo Calf Woman. So that means that, that, that this whole thing, and why would, why would ancestors pick a two-spirit woman to go get the hair from that white buffalo? You know, these are the things that, that, that our, our people have to look at and ask these questions. Why are people doing these specific things? Why have I been chosen, well, two-spirit person decide, you know, chosen to carry the white buffalo hair? But these are all important things as indigenous people. Um, these are our prophecies. Um, and, and, and I really, really hope that uh, more Indigenous people start um, listening in on, on, on what's going on in, in that regard. And, um, and um, I'll pray for everyone. <laughs> That's all I do. I'm a prayerful person. That's all I do nowadays. I'm, I'm, I'm just enjoying life for once um, and, and doing the work that I, I really enjoy the most. And that's, that's working for the environment. Uh, and working on behalf of the animals and, and the medicines and, and the water and the land, uh, reclaiming history. Um, I've registered a museum for Winnipeg and I'm working on the board for that. I've registered the Clan Grandmothers of Canada. Um, I've registered the Dakota Ayati Association. Uh, so I'm working on all those boards as well to try and get everything in, in, in order and put in place um, um, for what I see the, for, for, the, for us in the future here in Winnipeg. So uh, just I'm just getting started because I just retired. So I'm just getting started now. <laughs> just just retired. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> you do so so much work, Geraldine, on all all the different levels, all the different places, and so yeah, just so incredibly grateful to have you to have you on with us to be able to share your knowledge and to share your stories. You know when Warren and I were talking about bringing this panel together, that's really what we wanted to do was to offer an opportunity for folks to be able to share stories that maybe haven't been heard. And of course, like doing environmental work, I know of the spirit of the Buffalo camp, but I had no idea the whole story behind it. So hey, there's you. more. I'm yeah, it's more. It's just, so it's more. giving you a snippet. <laughs> just a snippet. <laughs> Thank you so, so incredibly you. much for, <laughs> for sharing and for, for being here, especially yeah, in, in these weird and emotional and difficult and difficult times for people. So Thank you so much again and for sharing with us. And yeah, next we're gonna we're gonna pass it over to Dana. Dana's gonna tell us their story and all of their things. <laughs> <laughs> wow, um, wow, big miigwetch to both Geraldine and Albert, like to follow you guys is like pretty um, intimidating because like, damn, but like what incredible knowledges and stories and histories to be shared. Like I just feel so full already, I'm just like, I, you know, like, like, you know, you get your real nice gitch because like, we're, we're sticking it through, like we're here, you know? So, <laughs> uh, Ani, my name is Dana Danger. Um, I am, uh, was born in so-called Saskatchewan, 
and uh, grew up in uh, so-called Winnipeg, Manitoba or Treaty 1 territory. Um, you know, uh, my family is, like, part of my family is Métis Soto from like more northern uh, Manitoba, like grew up in the Paw, also Cold Lake, Manitoba. Um, my great granny was born on the land there and was a high tanner. And so I've been really like drawn to that work and like to speak to that a lot. And then on uh, my dad's side, um, Polish, Polish mixture of <laughs> Danish and all sorts of other things. So like real, real Métis through and through, man, you know, and it got that Polish Ukrainian flavor from Winnipeg. So it's like, you know, the North End, there's like some really good pierogi places and Kubasa places. So if you need that hookup, talk to me. Cause I, every time I fly back home, to Winnipeg it's like that's the that's what's up I gotta get the pickerel gotta get the pierogies and gotta get the kubasa like that's it you know so um but yeah so now I'm currently in uh Joni Jojage or so-called Montreal been here for about the last seven years came here to do some school stuff and now I'm just kicking it because uh you know never thought of Métis with you know the Mohawks here are pretty cool like a really like there's a solid crew here for sure. And lots of like, lots of urban niches too, like from all over the place, you know, the Two-Spirit community here is one that's like very unsung. Like they, they've been here for a while, but like, like the politics that is Quebec, you know, that's a whole thing, right? So um, I identify as Two-Spirit just cause I, really um, want to honor all of that work that was done specific, you know, in Winnipeg, and it feels good to call that, but in queer, you know, queer, like whatever, you know, those are all really good things too. I love that there's a really, you know, I like seeing the ways in which like language and how we identify ourselves is like so, is so cool because you can really kind of almost timestamp where certain folks came into like uh, where, where certain folks are having certain visions or like different stories or timelines of like how we interact with each other. Two, like two spirit folks are like really interesting because like so much of us are like, we're such a global people. Like we really, I found most can, you know, most, some of my good friends are not even living in the same lands that I'm in, you know? And so we try to use these moments to come together and to share with each other because we're all doing such important work. That's really what I see if you're, under this umbrella of being indigenous and gay, you know, you just, you just do everything. Cause like we just, you know, it just seems like that at least we all have like these like incredible gifts to share. So, um, you know, and I, I really, um, I really appreciate the visual, the visuals. So thank you so much, Albert, for showing all of those images it was so great. And that's kind of why I've like hijacked this webinar to like, I have my phone set up and I'm like beating as we're talking because I really need, um, I have such trouble like starting projects because I just, um, I don't know, I'm a procrastinator through and through. Like, you know, the action is so important, but it's just like the, the tension of it, of, of, of completing something is just like too much for me. That's why I'm like been doing work for years, like the same freaking shit. Cause like, I can't not, you know, it's just like, um, it's care. It's, when you know you're looking inwards of like the gifts that you have you know it just like makes you know you just really want to have the space to really think about all these things and i think that's really the ancestors really want me to slow down because there's just so much to absorb um and there's so many gifts to share and like so much space to to make way for those who are coming behind us you know so um yeah it's always trying to keep those um the, um, that worldview and very much like that way of relating to each other you know I I remember a time when it was really lonely when I didn't think there was like lots of other folks um, out there that were indigenous and queer and um, and it's so funny that to be growing up in like a really a two-spirit hub uh, you know um, in Winnipeg and and just to know that they were right there like they just were always kind of around and like once you just got to start asking you know, and I was so afraid to ask for that because I wasn't, you know, um, as a recovering Catholic as well, there was that fear, that guilt and shame in there too. So um, I'm super grateful for just like the existence of like indigenous queer people because it just like makes it, that you just, you feel like you're like, okay, I can, I can like live, I can live another day. This is, this is dope. There's so, there's like so many of us. So 
just to just to see people's existence is like for me is like the is the resistance is like we've just like continued to just like live and be here so um those are just kind of like some of the few things that came off the the top of my head and you know as a as a bit you know as a person that is a song like you know i'm i carry a pipe and i've been to many different ceremonies and it's really hard um because there's like so much harm reduction work that's coming up and so many different things that like in order to be like ourselves and to be safe in ceremony is super hard and it's really um i i really commend all those folks that are brave enough to speak up for their bodily sovereignty and how is it that i think somebody's brave for just like needing to exist you know it's like it's like that you have this fear that you will that you your people won't even like see you um or you know that somehow the your ways of being in your body are um are not like our people's ways and that just doesn't seem okay to me and so i think what I've learned from other two spirit elders around me is just to continue to speak up. Cause all of the ones that I know are like, are really out there. They're out there. They're loud. They're proud. And like, I, you know, and even for the ones that are quiet, I still see you because we're all extra. Like, let's be real about it. You know, I have, it's really rare to be like a quiet, like two spirit person. Like they exist. I realize this, but you get them around uh, you get them in a safe space and all of a sudden it's like fireworks, you know? So that's just how I see it. So, yeah. Thanks so much, Dana. If you've never seen Dana's art, I very much <laughs> recommend that you check it out, especially as we talk about things like bodily autonomy and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Very Baby much oil. relates. Yeah. <laughs> Baby oil for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, check out Dana's art if you don't already know of Dana's art. It's fantastic. Um, and then finally, we have Brendan, who I learn things from all the time. Brendan has a very informational uh, Instagram account. So <laughs> always learning new things from Brendan, new histories, new ways of, of thinking and knowing and being. So Brendan, if you want to wrap out our introductions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so my name is Brendan. Um, Thank you to everybody who spoke before me. Um, I'm really happy to be in these spaces, even though it's really hard right now for us to, to come together and there's so many like boundaries and, and, and stuff. Um, but yeah, so yeah, my name is Brandon. Um, I was born and raised in Regina. Um, I'm 28 years old now. Um, I spent like the first 22 years of my life uh, here. I had about six years of my life um, as a kid in Saskatoon. Um, but for the most part, a lot of my learning um, is pretty new, so like in the last six years. Um, and in 2014, I moved out east to Michisagi territory or Mississauga uh, Anishinaabeg territory um, to attend university. Um, and the program I, I attended uh, was Indigenous Environmental Studies. Um, but by leaving home, I really learned that I, um, like when you leave what you're comfortable with and what you know, you really challenge yourself and ask yourself lots of questions. Um, before leaving home, I wasn't really that out, like my close friends and, and family knew, but it wasn't something that I was like publicly confident with. Um, and it was through student organizing that I learned, you know, to be okay with myself, to, to see the importance of like intersectionality within our movements. Um, and it was also, leaving home was also the time that I got more connected with culture and ceremony. Um, in here in Regina, I didn't, I didn't grow up with anything, but when I moved out east, um, I was introduced to Nishtabek Firekeeper teachings. Um, and it was, it was a really amazing learning journey for me to become comfortable with ceremony and just for it to be so normalized and like not for it to seem, you know, landish or, or strange or, or what have you. Um, and then for story and for, for it to be spaces where stories like this are just kind of normalized and it's, it's not, it's not considered strange, uh, strange or weird. Um, but it was also through firekeeping that I learned that I don't know if I quite fit within like, like um, men's teachings and like I think they're really important and I think we need to have um, more spaces where men's teachings are really like um, you know revitalized because there are a lot of healthy traditional masculinities that can can be brought back like there's a lot of 
teachings about balance and, and how to respect fellow like, beings, I guess, that we don't often see in mainstream masculinity and toxic masculinity and what have you. Um, and I think that, I think definitely think that's important, but I just, I realized that it wasn't really a space for me. Um, and um, it was, it was, I think it was like, I think a lot of my learning about myself as, as a, as a queer, for the most part really came around, I guess, those edges at first, like where I realized where I didn't really, where it wasn't really for me. Um, another experience I draw upon was I went to um, Indigenous Climate Action had hosted, um, uh, partnered with a bunch of our organizations um, to host like this international um, Indigenous climate gathering in Aotearoa or New Zealand. And um, when I went there, um, like I was, I was, you know, a complete culture clash. Um, and I realized that a lot of people like coded me as a man. Um, and um, Maori culture, they use bro a lot. Um, so it was, it was, this is kind of why I have this hat. Um, and it was like a lesson for me that like, hey, this is not quite where I sit. Um, and then when I had come home later that same summer, so this was in 2018, I went both to the two international, two, two, international two-spirit gathering in Winnipeg, and then also out on the land hosted by El Saskatoon. And I think that was the first time that I really actually was able to like really encounter indigenous queerness like that was centered and it wasn't it wasn't othered or it wasn't like it wasn't me trying to realize who I am by by finding negative space it was by who I am by finding positive space like space that is actually us um and I don't know it was it was I think really really empowering um that was where I met Albert Albert uh, met me there um and it was I think that the thing that I was going through something difficult that year too but I think what made that gathering so amazing was like just how how many stories were shared so like hearing the story of where the whole like the whole dream where two spirit came from um was amazing listening to like all the old um uh all the older like um uh cookums and mushrooms and what 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 not like um just being really like funny and and just the jokes they made were really amazing um and just how unapologetically queer and and even sexual sometimes they were, it was really, really awesome. Um, seeing really young um, uh, two-spirit and indigenous, indigenous queer youth just like, like suddenly open up and um, seeing people around my age that were doing the leadership for that and, and getting them to make dresses. Um, yeah, so it was a really amazing experience. Um, it was also like a teach, they taught me a lot about myself because there was an opportunity for me to make um, a dress and, or a skirt, and I, I, I recognize I didn't really feel comfortable with that, and I didn't really, have to, I couldn't really understand why, and, and I think for me, um, I really like the idea of finding, like, gender that is in between, and, and what that looks like, obviously, is different for everybody, but um, it was after going to Out Saskatoon's event, where we, you know, heard more stories about, like, non-binary um, gender identities, um, specifically in Cree, um, and, um, yeah, so I guess that probably sum, summarizes my my learning up until this point. Um, I mean, I'm still learning. I have a lot to learn about my culture. Like I said, I grew up I grew up without really knowing it, and I learned a lot of Nishabe culture. But um, I'm Cree and um, Métis, so like I need to learn more about that, and I need to learn more about it here in the prairies. Um, but yeah, so I guess that's that's me. That's my story. Thank you so much for sharing, Brendan. Again, Brendan is a great educator and I very much like appreciate and enjoy following Brendan on, <laughs> on social media and being able to kind of have my own educational journey um, through, through Brendan. So very much appreciate all the, all the work that you're always doing, Brendan. Um, yeah, to educate yourself and to, to share it with other folks is really inspiring. Um, so yeah, just kind of getting into our next section. We have a half an hour left, so we'll just kind of, um, we'll just go over some, some things about, you know, like inclusivity, intersectionality and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I don't know if folks have anything in particular that they want to, to speak to further. Warren, I don't know if you have any, any questions in particular you want to raise. Otherwise I can, I can throw something out there. Yeah, I just had one question, but um, I really thank the speakers for sharing their knowledge with us. And um, I'll elaborate more on that. But one of the questions that I, 
I was pondering on is how can indigenous folks be more inclusive of two of people with two spirit identities? So if somebody would be open to responding to that. I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the advocacy work we've done with indigenous leadership and um, uh, you know, for many years, we always look to the formal, you know, political representative organizations like uh, Assembly of First Nations, you know, Inuit Tipiriat Kanatami for the Inuit, and then the uh, Métis National Council, uh, just in terms of uh, having a voice, uh, you know, um, being represented, and then receiving uh, resources that we legit legitimately should have access to as indigenous people, you know, whether we're status or non-status or off-reserve, on-reserve or Métis or Inuit, that, that you know, um, that, that's part of colonization is that th these resources that have been negotiated on their behalf is for everybody. And a lot of times, two-spirit people, we get left out of it. You know, housing is a huge issue on reserve for two-spirit people. And I don't want to generalize because I know in, in First Nations, some two-spirit people have their own houses, but there's many, you know, um, who don't have a house and are really couch surfing on their reserves with relatives. And some are in their 50s and some are in their 60s. And these are elders, like two-spirit elders, you know, still couch surfing, you know, and, and, and that's what I mean. So the advocacy we've done over the last 30 years has borne some fruit recently in that uh, the AFN in 2018, there was a resolution put on the floor at their assembly in Vancouver to support a national two-spirit uh, network and organization in Canada. And that resolution passed unanimously. So 640 First Nations have tacitly or, you know, uh, supported this national network. So the funding is flowing. And again, that's, that's, that's a mechanism for our work. Um, uh, nationally, and then, uh, then I know in Manitoba last year, uh, the Manitoba Métis Federation announced its first uh, two-spirit uh, local, which is um, uh, the two-spirit Mitchell local. And again, so there is some movement. Uh, there's uh, the, uh, the space, safer space in the political arena that we're starting to, uh, you know, and then even just, uh, I think yesterday, uh, uh, up up north, uh, one of the tribal councils uh, or one of the representative organizations just had a diversity conference or event, and uh, you know it was about two spirit inclusion. So it's happening slowly, and I think it's because we're a different generation. You know, where youth are coming out. You know, when they're small, whether they're gay, lesbian, or trans, or bisexual. And so the families are already socialized to that. And now their family members, or they themselves might be band counselors or chiefs. So they influence the decisions around inclusivity. And so we're starting to see that movement now. And that, uh, so yeah, so I think uh, it has taken a long time of educating and advocating, but it is starting to show some, some results. Anyone else that wants to to speak to that kind of how um, indigenous folks can be more inclusive of two spirit identities? I can go. Sure, go for it, Brendan. Um, I think we really, really need to like be open. Um, and as communities and reflective about our relationship to the church and to Christianity. And I mean, this isn't to say that all Christians are homophobic or that if indigenous peoples choose Christianity as their spirituality, that there's anything wrong with that. Um, I just think that the, we need to really have a long conversation about how the residential schools have really, really harmed our communities and how that harm is then displaced upon like queer and trans indigenous folks um, and, and, you know, and women and like, and pretty much everybody that at the time the church as an institution was oppressing. Um, and for me, I'm fortunate that my family doesn't really have, like doesn't really have that, I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't say problem, but like I'm pretty, I'm pretty accepted and supported in my family, but I know that others aren't so lucky. And like, I think we need to have like 
larger community conversations just just about about that and i mean there 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 are opportunities to have this too in a way that doesn't just um doesn't just dismiss christianity because there are a lot of queer and trans christians as well um but i just i feel like we need to really have yeah just pretty on conversations about what that has done um and and what that continues to do to our families and to our communities Yeah, I'm sorry, Geraldine. I I think I I missed I missed your hand. If you want to if you want to speak to that as well. Oh, here. Sorry, you're muted. Uh, do do do. Let me just. There we go. All right. Yep. We should be good now. Hi. Yeah. Yep. A big part about it. Uh, I I think. Uh, in regards to two spirits. Uh, it's it's all about education and talking more openly about it. And, and I think for myself, being an older two-spirit woman, I, I know for a fact I was born two-spirit. I knew that since I was a little baby. Um, uh, I, I have memories, of course, since I was very, very young that I remember even being in a diaper. And um, as, long, uh, as, long, as, long as, like, as long as I've been alive, and from what my understanding is as a two-spirit woman, um, it was for me it's always been about um uh, i was never excluded from the ancestors and i think that's something important for us all to remember um they uh the ancestors it's not an issue with them who we are and so when they talk to us and show us things um that 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 is of great importance our spirituality our connection to who we really are and um of course, that is is very predominant um, in in all our cultures. Um, but for myself, as a Dakota Two Spirit woman, uh, I find um, for myself right now, I am I am strong and I stand strong in who I am, and I've always known who I am. For myself, uh, what I'm dealing with is is for the Dakota people. Um, we all sit here in Winnipeg on our Dakota traditional territory. So for me, my fight right now is, is the environment, of course, because I've always been connected. I, I, I hear the plants. I've heard a rock. I carry that rock in my bundle. And um, when we look throughout history, um, that many of these things have occurred in, with our relatives in the past, our ancestors. Um, Crazy Horse carried a rock, and, and that rock protected him in, in wartime. Um, all of these connections, all of these things are so extremely important for who we are. And, and, and really paying attention to these things. Because our ancestors, one of the messages I got from an ancestor was that um, they'd whispered to me one time because it was a message for someone else that I had to give someone. And they said, we have infinite PhDs up here. Nobody can pull anything on us. So I always think of that. And, and you know, when I, when I look around and I meet people and, and when uh, they exclude us, and they forget the history of who we were and what we've done. Um, that kind of an understanding and, and, and that education, always, we always have to give that back to our people and back to our youth and, and give them that pride and encourage them um, you know, to listen. And I'm always reminded by ancestors, they always tell me, tell them to listen. Tell them to listen. They're trying to talk to so many of us, um, but there's something that's, that's for some reason uh, we're turned off. Many people are turned off, and when you turn on, and you can you really pay attention and you listen, they can show us and guide us through all of what we're going through. Right now, I'm being shown and guided through what I'm going through, and the work that I'm doing is the work that I'm doing on behalf of of, of them up there. And they show me, and and share these wonderful things for all of us. They're not just for me, but so the work that I'm doing is for all of us and on and behalf of us. And, and of course, my Dakotas are gonna always shine through because I believe in my prophecy and I carry this, the hair of the white buffalo calf woman. And that's extremely important, that story of, 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 of what she left for us and that she would come back and help us when we needed her the most. And she's back, she came back. I saw her at Sandin Rock and another woman saw her with me. Um, and so these, the, the history of who we are is extremely, extremely important because it's what, what ties us and binds us to Turtle Island, all of us, um, is, is the essence, what we walk on, Mother Earth, and, and everything that we're doing to protect her. 
and the work that we do um, for ourselves to to rise up and show society and show the world uh, who we are and that we're not gone, we're not we're not gone we're not going anywhere. So um, education um, of spirituality, I find for myself extremely extremely important, and I and I do talk to a lot of people. Like I say, it's um, uh, at times I just find there's not enough belief in in hearing and listening to those voices and um i and i I'm, I'm praying all the time every day i pray for 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 people to hear these extremely wonderful voices of our ancestors because they do have a lot of knowledge to share with us and and um so for me that's what it is i think sharing that spirituality and embedding that back into who we are as indigenous people because who we are in history is very important and today who we are is very important to bring that balance back with with without the two spirit people how is there to be balanced back in our communities, all of them? And so um, um, the education of that and the understanding. And so the museum that, uh, that I'm opening is, um, is, the, the, is, 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 is that, is to, to share a lot of stories and understandings of our history. Um, because I, I, I see um, where we can um, change that history and yet still retain who exactly we are as spiritual people, as two spirit people. And, and us be in that fine balance in all of our communities. So um, definitely something that, that, that I feel is really important is, is that spirituality part. Yeah, thank you so much, Geraldine. Just, um, yeah, kind of thinking of all of these, all these different intersections um, of, our, of our identities as peoples um, and as indigenous folks, as queer folks. Um, you know, really thinking as well just to, to recognize and to honor that um, intersectionality itself was a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in the 80s, um, who is a, a Black civil rights activist and a legal scholar. Um, and yeah, just to recognize that, you know, she saw that as, you know, as a Black woman feeling excluded from the, from the feminist movement because she was Black, but then at the same time, feeling excluded from the uh, anti-racist movement, from the black movement because she was a woman. So um, yeah, just really, you know, kind of recognizing how the, the different intersecting natures of our identity, kind of the different overlapping um, parts of our identities and kind of what, what those mean and how they all come together and how, you know, and, and me just being, being an indigenous queer person, how that's different from someone who identifies as two spirit, um, and how our identities are different from other folks um, within, the, within the queer community. Um, and so just kind of off of that as well, I'm wondering that for, you know, because this is, this is Pride Month, um, kind of what are, what are some of your experiences with Pride, I suppose, or what, what can we do to make Pride less, uh, less decolonial, <laughs> if you will? Um, you know, I, I feel like just personally that Pride um, and many, many queer spaces, um, I think, especially being in Ottawa, can often feel very, uh, very exclusive, very um, white-centered. So what are maybe some things that you've done or things that you think would be helpful in terms of kind of decolonizing that space? Whoever. Yeah. Yeah, what we've done in Winnipeg is, um, uh, you know, because our first Pride here was 1987, and the Two Spirit people were part of that first Pride. And in those days, it was dangerous. You know, you could experience violence, or you could, uh, you know, be ostracized if you're seen as being out, or you could even lose your job, those kind of things. So in 1987, it was still quite raw. But, you know, so it's been a long time we've been having our Pride, and more recently, um, you know, the community, whether it's, you know, queer people of color or uh, indigenous or two-spirit people, about what does pride mean to us? What does a safe space mean to us? What does culture, pride culture mean to us? So we've hosted an annual two-spirit gathering for the last three years. We've had to postpone our fourth one, which would have been uh, this year. And we've also had a sacred fire at the forts, which was introduced as well, which is just a quiet place with a fire and you could do an offering and you could have an orange or a bottle of water uh, because pride can be very hectic and it create a lot of expectations. And then the day after it's like flat and it's back to you know regular life and it's boring. But anyway, so it's really negotiating those spaces with, the pride allies, right? 
to say, because we have a Pride Week here as well, so we do other events. But during that, we have the Family Day, which is a Saturday, which is the whole venue stuff with, you know, the vendors and whatnot. And that's when we have our powwow. And so it's a very family oriented and the community comes. And uh, last year we had over a hundred dancers from the community, 10 drum groups. Uh, you know, we fed 250 people a feast. And, and, and for two spirit people, it's about our family and our whole community. It's not a select group of two spirit people in this age range with this type of job, right? So when we celebrate, we bring the babies in the strollers, we bring, you know, uncle and granny, and we give away a lot of prizes, we eat a lot of food, we dance, we sing, and we drum. And for us as two spirit people, that's our representation of pride. And, you know, thankfully we're able to do it at the Forks. Uh, and to, can you, and there will be other things that will come. Uh, that are sort of culturally specific to two-spirit people and identity and pride and celebration. There. Yeah. It's, it's so funny to hear that because like I, I'm so happy to have been able to experience the two-spirit power in Winnipeg, but like such a stark difference to organizing here in so-called Montreal. It's like it's quite abysmal, I'd say. <laughs> um, we don't really have a center. Uh, we had one, um, and apparently the there wasn't enough people showing up, so they decided to cancel the programming. And how many times have we heard this sort of stuff, that um, funding is only contingent on us gathering together, but, you know, what I've known from gathering together, like physically trying to get two-spirit folks together is... Um, often uh, you want to come with a buddy, you want to know somebody that's already going to be there. That's like, like that level of safety already. Or are you known in the community? Are you a beacon in the community? Because like, you know, I'm sure I'll, us here alone have been beacons in the community for other people to be like, okay, this is a safe person to talk to, you know, this is a person, you know, so you get, you get known by your actions and how you are a relative, like how are you a relative and how are you carrying yourself? Um, you know, I was just like thinking about the first question before that, you know, about those spaces, because I'm just like, you know, um, there's a particular flavor that definitely likes to go to pride, you know, and uh, it's not always for everybody. And that's like great that there is so much um, with the two spirit events, how we see how that really shifts and changes that culture. And yet we can still be sexy beasts, you know, like I've seen some looks being pulled there around the, you know, you got the traditional dresses, you know, and then you got like the tube tops and like people getting lots of sun and like, or, you know, all sorts of things. Um, but I think for me, the biggest challenge that I've seen also in like different two-spirit organizing is like kind of like harm reduction that's around that. Um, because you know a lot of our uh, ceremonies and that are and that are tied to sobriety and are tied to a lot of like ways of looking and it's just another kind of like form of um, you know of of control in a sense um, we want to be respectful of um, these teachings but a lot of them you know I know a lot of our um, some of our kin are like really not doing okay and um i'd be pressed to see somebody actually be able to wait the 24 hours before they're you know clean or whatever that looks like and um you know um i'm a very big advocate for harm reduction in that to be in like if our people are sick give them ceremony you know if you're sick if you're not sick you don't go to the doctor you go to the doctor when you're sick and that's like our medicines like that's our teachings so when i was gifted um the responsibility of like being able to carry a drum like a big drum which is very you know that that's a whole thing we could talk about gender and roles with um, drums and different things that we carry you know um there are some really amazing people around me who have like really pushed for for that to be um, a thing and so we have this two-spirit healing drum that exists here now and um it's still very hard for people to get together for that to be supported out here for two-spirit youth to be able to feel like they can come together, but we're seeing that change big time. We're seeing, um, I'm seeing this whole generation of two-spirit youth that um, that have, some of them have gone through the university, but not all, you know, and um, and it depends, like uh, in the urban, in urban centers, you're gonna see people, 
either, you know, if, if they've left home to come to university or whatever, you know, cities become these beacons or have been for a long, long time. Um, and so all of us are all together with all of our different teachings, you know, and so to, we have to do a lot of work, you know, that communication with each other about what are our protocols, what are our consent, you know, what feels good, what doesn't, you know, and having those bigger discussions, those are all happening. Like, I don't think two spirit people are, sh uh, or indigenous queer people or indigenous queer people are afraid of having these conversations, you know, um, with each other. We're definitely not, or we're always considering our safety when we start to have these conversations outwardly where we're always the ones that are pushing those buttons because we always have, we're always asking those questions, you know, of like, of why things are the way that they are. And that's the only way that we're going to continue to, um, you know, share those gifts, the gifts of like, of, ch of challenging the, the status quo, you know, because it doesn't, there's no room in society for our narratives, like as it's, as, um, you know, um, as it's been seen, but we know that's not true. We know that there's multiplicities of experiences that can exist. And each one of us has a gift and a story to share to you about two spirit people. Um, you know, just some of us are like, um, uh, you know, have used different platforms and access. But I think about the grannies, you know, that are behind the scenes that we don't get to see in all those knowledges, you know, that we, um, don't have access to because of sometimes the ways that we're read in our communities and um, having more openness to that and really having those conversations is so, so important. Um, and vis but, you know, in one flip of the hand, we can say visibility is like important. We want to see representation. And then we know that it's also uh, scary to be so visible that people are going to project their ideas on you and kind of call you down. And like, we don't do that. Like, uh, we shouldn't be doing that in our communities where we really need to like, if you got a problem with somebody, go talk to them about it, you know, things like that. But it's, it's, but there's so many different ways to do this, you know? And so for me, the biggest thing is just like, uh, it's just like listening to each other, you know? And if some of us want pride, like let's, you know, let's give it to them. And if some of, you know, we can all want different things and it can still be okay. You know, how we organize, you know? Like, I'd like to think that I'm grassroots, but I work for an institution. So there's already a power dynamic there. So I got to be real about that. You know, I've made work off of like uh, working at shelters at working at. And for me, it feels so extractive because here I am as a person that's given this responsibility of whether or not you get to stay in this place tonight. It's a lot of like crazy um, things that we don't really like think about that, um, just because we're in these positions doesn't also mean that like, we're, uh, that we're, uh, that we're co-signing that these places are safe. We can't just like include people, indigenous people into these spaces. And then just like, you know, are, is your organization doing indigenous solidarity? Are you talking about performative allyship? Are you doing all that stuff? So that's kind of like a smidgen of what I feel about some of those things. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dana. Yeah, that's so important to also, you know, think about different aspects of ceremony, which we all know ceremony can be a very, it's a very touchy subject. <laughs> yeah, but thinking about kind of the different ways that ceremony um, can be gendered or can be um, exclusive to people as well when you're talking about things like, um, yeah, uh, you know, requirements around being being clean um, and just how that can exclude so many people in our communities, the very people who at the same time are probably those who really need that ceremony as well. Um, and even when you're talking about, um, you know, space and whatnot, too, I thought immediately of the, the Black Lives Matter protest at the, at the Toronto Pride uh, because of all the, the, all the police being invited to take part in the protest. And they were like, all right, screw you guys. Like, we're just going to interrupt it then <laughs> because, you know, this isn't respecting our communities. So that's a good point as well, though, is that it's, um, yeah, it's one thing to say, like, you know, oh, this pride, that pride, you know, wants to include Indigenous representation, but what does that mean, you know? It's not enough to just have, like, a, you know, oh, we, we got a two-spirit person, like, we're good now. <laughs> Checkbox, we're good, like, we've got our Indigenous representation, but, you know, what does that mean to not just be, be an ally, but to be, like, an accomplice, to be, to be a co-conspirator is really important, and yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. Yeah, it's definitely happening here, and we have to recognize that when we're telling somebody no, because, like, you're not wearing a skirt or they want to wear a skirt, but they're, they can't. We're just like, it's, it's violent. It's a violent thing to do. Cause you're essentially saying that your, your body yourself is not good enough to be a part of your culture. Like it doesn't make, 
that's how I feel, but it doesn't, I think people don't understand that connection of like, of how important that could be, how important someone's bodily autonomy is. But I mean, that's consent. And we know that because of colonization was not consent, you know, we know that. And so that if, if that's where all of this stems from, we, we know consensual practices are like, are one of the, I think one of the keys for sure. So. I feel like I want to have a <laughs> webinar just on that. <laughs> well, yeah, and I, I totally, I don't really hear what you guys are saying about that, but you know, from traditional, from traditionally, like as a Dakota woman, um, for myself, um, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I, I find sexual conversations, I don't like to hear them, um, for, for whatever reasons. And, and as a Dakota woman, when I'm around ceremony or sacred fire, even though I'm too spirited, and I understand what people are saying that, but for Dakota women, we got to have our knees covered. There's reasons why we cover our knees and have our long skirts. Dakota people even... We have to have our elbows covered, our women. And, you know, being at Standing Rock, um, I actually got to talk to some women about, about that. And that's just how we were, because our women found that that was, that was how we safeguarded ourselves. Also, it was to keep the men's minds pure by not showing ourselves, um, to keep their thoughts focused on what, 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 what was at hand in ceremony. So there was plenty of reasons traditionally why Dakota women why we wear our skirts below our knees and, and we wear shirts past our elbows. Um, and those are just things that, that's how we are. As Dakota, Lakota, and Dakota people, I don't know about Dakota, but I know Lakota, Dakota for sure. Um, that's our understanding. And yes, there's the skirt mafia. Um, they're very well known. <laughs> I was warned by my auntie before I went out to Standing Rock, you know, watch out for the skirt mafia. I helped many of uh, young women at the Two Spirit Camp who came in crying. And of course, the skirt mafia came after them, and, and I had to calm them down and give them, you know, a good talk, and, and, and I wrapped them up with whatever I had in my, in, in my tent, which was I had a bunch of shawls and wraparounds. So I would just wrap them up, and I'd tell them, okay, you know what, dry up those tears, my girl, and you get out there with that shawl, and you show them, now you're ready to go. Don't let them, you know, don't let them make you back down from, from being around the sacred fire or anything. It's about being tough. Skirt Mafia knew better than to come bother me over there. I mean, oh, they knew darn well. When I was in my coveralls and working with, uh, you know, I'm working with saws and I'm, and I'm building, and, you know, they would try to bring it up. And I said, like, no, 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 you wait a minute. A woman can't, if a woman's a tradeswoman, I'm not wearing no bloody skirt. So there are specific times, you know, and, and I stood up to the Skirt Mafia at Sandra, and, and you knew who the Skirt Mafia was over there. Because they were very bold and very aggressive, those women. And, and you know what? And that's traditionally how they are. We can't change the way tradition is and how it's been. Uh, and, and so if, if, if people feel that, um, you know, it, it's, it's not because it's a personal thing of, of how our women are. It's because it's what we've always known. And, and so that's just kind of how it is with the Dakota and the Lo Lakota people. And, you know, and again, uh, we're all different cultures. We all feel completely different. We have our different ceremonies, our different understandings about things, right? And we've got to respect those things. We have to respect those things. And, you know, one time I heard a woman made a, uh, in, in a circle, a woman made a bunch of women cry who were using. And they, she was telling them, you just need to go and clean up for a month before you, uh, you know, where, before you can go to ceremony and stuff. And I'll tell you something. That was the wrong thing to say because that's very a colonialistic behavior. When you tell someone that they have to clean up before they can go to ceremony a month or whatever. No, our ancestors have our arms, their arms wrapped around us right through our, our addictions. And that's when they're around us the most, hugging us and putting their hands on our shoulders. And that's why we pray. That's why every day everybody should pray uh, and, uh, you know, I think people don't understand to pray. It's not like a church thing for our people. It's like you're just constantly talking to those people up there. And, and I have conversations with them all the time. I tell them what goes on here, how I feel about everything. And you know what? I get answers and I'm showing stuff. Sometimes they'll send me a song to calm me down that, 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 that actually is 
is is is pertains to what I was 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 upset about. And then I'll hear a song come on, and in that song, that song will calm me down, and it'll play exactly right when I'm right after my prayer or whatever. Uh, you know, when I'm done. And so there's interesting things about that, and 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 I think that we shouldn't be having colonialistic behaviors when it comes to our healing traditionally. There's no thing, there's no such thing about our people needing to clean up a month before going to ceremony. Um, yeah, we need to clean four days prior and we need to prepare ourselves a little bit. But there's elders that I spoke to who said, you know what, when someone needs help, or even at times we won't even ask you to clean up for four days. We'll tell you the night before to stop and to just come that day clean because that's when you're really weak. That's when you need the help. That's when you need that ceremony. That's when you need to sweat. That's when you need to do those things. Is when you're very weak, and your and your and your and that addiction has just a tight control on you. That's when you need uh, your ceremony the most. Um, and so you know we have to look at, at at these 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 ways of being, and that 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 spirituality and our ancestors. They're not judging us up there, and they're not. You know what, they're there every moment of the day to talk and to give us messages and, and to help us to heal because there's a lot of healing that has to happen. Um, it's, it, you know, it's not just from the residential schools. It's all, and I said that to my auntie one time and she was, we were talking about the residential schools and I said, you know, and she was telling about the nuns and the, and the priests and stuff. And I said, you know what, auntie, I said, I can imagine how hard that must have been on you to have those white strangers do that to you. That must have been very difficult. I said, but Auntie, I said, can you imagine how I felt when the people that came back from those schools, the people I loved, the people I trusted and I cared about, those people are the ones that came and hurt me, my very own people, not the white nuns, not the right priests. So there's a whole new generation now of us having to heal from being hurt by our own people. And that's, right. that's a really, that's a tough thing to get through. And, and so, you know, that, that's the kind of healing that, 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 that needs to be done now. Um, because, you know, it, it, yeah, the residential schools and, and, and colonialism and all this stuff has done a lot of crap to us. But now it's that colonialism that's coming and biting us back in the, in the ass that's being, that's being pushed on us by our own people, too. They'd be like, you know, so we, our fight is, is, is incredible. And, and we have a lot of things um, to look at and, and to learn from. Because what do we learn from? Our mistakes. So look at our communities. Where are we making our mistakes? You know, look in history. And, 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 and we learn from all of these things. So, so a lot of these things are important. And I totally understand how the young people feel today about these things. Um, but, you know, a lot of, some of us older people, we have, we have these understandings and these ways of being ourselves. And, and we're not trying to be disrespectful to people um, or youth um, by saying certain things. But you got to remember, this is who we this is who we were from the past. This is who, how we were raised in the in, in different ways, older ways, right? A lot of how uh, uh, us older people are is is not how the young people are today. We're going and every generation is going to be different and different and different. And we have to learn to adjust. And we have to learn to be respectful, and we have to learn to, to teach these values and to teach to remind our kids that. You know, where we come from was a completely different place. And I know where they're coming from today is another completely different place. So it's yeah. a lot of teaching, a lot of understanding, a lot of respect towards one another and, and, and being patient with one another and, and trying to figure these things out all together. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of a lot of evolving a lot of evolving conversations, but it's mm -hmm. it's good that we can have these conversations and and can have space for it. So yeah, Geraldine, thank you as well for kind of yeah, bringing us to, yeah, remembering, you know, kind of how, what we have gone to the traditions that we have today and how they, they also vary, you know, we're all, we're also different. So, that, you know, we're not, we're not one monolithic people either. Um, we are in our time and I just want to, if anyone, I just want to make space for anyone to, if anyone has any final thoughts or anything you want to, you want to promote any further, please, please go ahead and take the time now. Albert, I see that you're your mic is off. I don't know if you want to. Say I just that. want to say that, you know, no, no intention or action is ever wasted. You know, if it's an idea, if it's a vision, let it grow and it will, right? That's the power that we have is, uh, you know, with our mind, our spirit. And when you got two spirits, it's very powerful. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah.
okay. <laughs> Dana, Brendan, Warren, any any last thoughts? Um, if I may, I just wanted to um, first of all thank Albert, Geraldine, Dana, and Brendan for you know sharing your of yourselves and with us. And I know that it may uh, touch other people's lives that are probably seeing this or will be seeing this. And so I thank you for honoring us with your wisdom and your knowledge and also bringing you know, light to these issues that need to be shared. And so my hope was that with by doing this is that we get the um, awareness out there in education that you know, our two-spirit people have a role to play in a very important responsibility to you know within our our communities in our sacred circle so i thank you all for your wisdom and your knowledge and your and I, so it just made me very excited and i wanted to my hope is that you know after discussing with lindsay that we can have more of this and that we can share more stories and more people can um you know be able to have a, a space that they can talk about their own experiences so that other people can relate and also feel safe about who they are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Warren. All right, if no one else has any anything else to say, just to say to everyone um, that's watching that we will be um, putting this out as a recording as well. So um, if you wanna share it with anyone else or want to rewatch it, we'll have that up. Um, yeah, and just thank you so much to everyone for tuning in and to, to all of our great speakers. And we hope to see you again at future webinars. Bye. Bye. <laughs>